Hello everyone, it's really nice to see you here again. My name is Ali Mohammed Nama. I am fourth grade medical student at College of Medicine, University of Baghdad. Uh, I am super highly interested in neurosurgery as my future specialty. And today I'm gonna present a lecture about the facial nerve neurosurgery. This lecture will be in three parts. The first part about the facial nerve anatomy, the basic anatomy, and then the surgical anatomy that we're depending on. And we will talk about the facial nerve schwannoma and also the hemifacial spasm. So stay tuned for these parts. And here we are, we're just going to give an introduction about the facial nerve. The facial nerve, as we know, is the seventh cranial nerve that emerge from here, from the lower part of the pons, and specifically anterior lateral part of the pons, and specifically from the pon to medullary junction that's between the medulla and the pons. It's emerge laterally, so it's a lateral to the abducens and slightly medial to the vestibular cochlear nerve, and uh, it originates and exiting here from the root exit zone as two roots, the motor root, as we can see it here, the main motor facial nerve, and also the nervous intermedius. It's not well uh, demonstrated on this picture, but it could be uh, here between the vestibular cochlear and the facial, so that's why it's called intermedius. Uh, and uh, before going on details of the facial nerve and how it's the anatomy organized, I just wanted to say what's the function of the facial nerve. Uh, from its name, it's responsible for the muscle that's responsible for the facial uh, expressions. Uh, and also it's responsible for the parasympathetic function of the lacrimation here uh, from the greater petrosal. Uh, also it's responsible for the salivation uh, of the submandibular and the sublingual gland from the corded tympani parts from it. Also responsible for the test sensation at your two third of the tongue and also has a function of pain and temperature of uh, the external ear that come from the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. These things will be demonstrated and clarified with the upcoming parts of this lecture. We're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the facial nerve. And here we are, let's to start with the origin of the facial nerve. Uh, as we said, it originates from the pons, from the lower part of the pons, from the pons medullary junction here. This is the main facial nucleus and uh, the motor one. And this is the fibers of the facial nerve making that loop around the abducens nerve and emerge lateral to it. That's the abducens nerve. By making this loop around the abducen, it will lead to a compression here on the floor of the fourth ventricle. So when we look for it from the posterior view, it will look like this. These two elevations uh, from the fourth ventricle called the facial calculi because it's come from the turning around the abducen, so leading to this compression. And when there is a uh, dysfunction or problem here on the facial calculi or an injury to the fourth ventricle, it can lead to problem to the facial and the abducens nerve also, okay? And here we are, uh, we're having this uh, axial section of the MRI. Uh, we can see here that both cerebellar hemisphere, here is the pons, that's the basilar artery, and here we can see how the facial nerve looping around the abducens and going laterally, and by this loop, it can forming this facial calliculi, okay? So now, uh, we will take the segments of the facial nerve. After it's emerging from here, from the uh, lower part of the pons laterally, it will run here on the sisters, uh, which mean that or it's like leak of CSF. Uh, this sister of the posterior cranial fossa, just before arising, are uh, coming here to be inside the internal auditory canal or making that so that we will talking about it in the, inside the inner ear. So we can see it here. That is the posterior cranial fossa. Here, that is the clivus. So the pons positioning here on the clivus and the facial nerve will emerge laterally to go here to be inside the internal acoustic meatus. And here it represent the cisternal part, the cisternal segment of the uh, facial nerve. 
also when it's uh, being inside the internal auditory or acoustic meatus or canal, uh, you can see it here. This is the cisternal part. Here is the internal meatal segment. And here, after it's emerged, you can see the labyrinthine or labyrinthinal segment. This labyrinthinal segment uh, give the geniculate ganglion here that will lead to the uh, greater petrosa that we will discuss later. And also forming the, lat the horizontal or the tympanic segment and also the mastoid segment and finally it emerged from the stylomastoid foramen to reaching the face and supplying the facial muscles as we can see in here it's emerged from here and uh, giving this branch of its that's five branches that we also know the cervical the buccal the mandibular uh, zygomatic and, and so on okay uh, and you can see it how it can uh, under the parotid, it's really superficial uh, part of the parotid. So you have to be worried about it in, in every surgery and each surgery for the parotid gland. Also, it's coming uh, here and uh, giving uh, rise to the posterior belly of the digastric and, and so on. Okay. Now we're finishing the basic anatomy of the facial nerve that we have to know. Now we will take segment, segment inside our skulls and inside the temporal bone and in a neurosurgical anatomy, neurosurgical way. So let's just start with the cisternal segment here. Before we go into the cisternal segment, let's to take this mnemonic. Uh, this mnemonic about how the nerve are organized, how the uh, eight and seven nerves complex organized. You can see it here, this mnemonic, the seven will be up, seven up, and the cock will be down. Coca-Cola, down, okay? Uh, that's mean the facial nerve in this organization will be up superiorly and anteriorly. This is the anterior and this is the posterior, you can say, okay? And the cock, mean the cochlear, will be down inferiorly and anteriorly. And for the um, vestibular, it has two parts, superior and inferior, mean one above, one uh, up and one below, and both of them are posteriorly. So let's take uh, um, a look for this picture. It is uh, demonstrating the cisternal segment. That is the retrosigmoid approach. Uh, this picture taken from a Rotom book. And uh, this picture uh, from the right side of the patient. So this is the pons, this is the pitras. Here is the internal auditory canal. So this complex coming from the pons to the internal auditory canal, it is the eight and seven complex, right? This one is the vestibular and this one is the facial. And why it's, the facial usually should be anterior? Yeah, it's anteriorly because we're looking from the posterior view, okay? And this also, the lower complex, nine and uh, 10 and 11. This one is the abducent going there. This one is the biggest one, the trigeminal giving the ophthalmic and the mandibular division, sorry, the maxillary division, the mandibular cannot be seen here uh, because it will be down. And now I can understand why the abducens going up. Uh, here is the V1, V2, oclomotor, trochlear, and the internal carotid, it's, it could be here. So that's the relation of the lateral of the cavernous sinus. So here we're demonstrating that the cisternal segment run inside uh, uh, the cisterns before going to the temporal bone, right? Here we're showing the meatal segment from the left side of the patient. This is the meatal segment of the facial and vestibular complex after drilling of the bone to, to see uh, the meatal segment. Cannot be, uh, cannot be seen without that drilling. Also, that's the, the tri trigeminal uh, nerve. Um, this segment's running like uh, eight, eight millimeters inside the internal acoustic meatus. And here we're going to see this, the axial section, that axial section demonstrating both cerebellar hemisphere uh, located here in the posterior cranial fossa and bounded by this uh, temporal bone or the petrous bone, you can say. Uh, this is the pons and laterally from the pons, we can see this, 
the, the, the facial and the vestibular nerve complexes. So after looking for this, you can see that this, this axial section is mimic typically for the previous picture. We will do a zoom and focusing on this area to look here for this radiological pictures uh, to see the vestibular and the facial complex. So can you look here? This one is the facial and this one is the vestibular. And how you can know that? Um, this one is anteriorly. And why this is anteriorly? Because here is the pons and uh, below is the cerebellum. So that's posterior, that's anterior. So that's anterior. So that's the facial nerve. And this one is the vestibular cochlear. Also here, the facial, the vestibular cochlear. This vessel, we'll talk about it later. And here, the vestibular cochlear, making that the cochlear part down and the vestibule that's here. So that's the vestibular part, okay? Now we will talk about the labyrinthine segment or the labyrinth segment. After the internal auditory canal or after the meatal segment, it's emerging here, the labyrinthine segment, it will run uh, three to four millimeters and then will forming this genicular ganglion um, this below is the tympanic and the mastoid segment. This up is the superficial greater petrosal nerve that's responsible for the lacrimation. And also this one uh, emerging here is the superior uh, vestibular uh, nerve. And this one is the labyrinthinal artery that's coming from the ICA that we will talk about it uh, later also. You can see it here again. Also, we have the meatal segment that's coming, the labyrinthinal segment, the geniculate ganglion, greater petrosal, and that's the tympanic and the mastoid. Also, the tympanic, you can know it's uh, situated between the incas and the lateral semicircular canal. This another forecast radiological picture. Uh, you can see it here that after the cisternal and the meatal segment that here we having the labyrinthinal segment and that's forming here the geniculate ganglion giving the tries for the superior oh sorry for the superficial greater petrosal i can't say superficial i can you can say greater petrosal so i just uh, uh combine this name <laughs> Um, here, this picture that we was talking about, just to demonstrate that the superficial petrosal nerve, after going up, it will be inside the foramen lacerum and uh, being here in the pterygoid canal, it's uh, and uh, with with uh, the deep petrosal nerve, the person, the sympathetic fiber, and also it's combined by the median artery that's coming from the internal carotid, and then he, it will reach here the trigopalatine fossa and forming the trigopalatine ganglion, and by some branch of the trigeminal, uh, some division, sorry, uh, it can reach the the lacrimal gland and do the lacrimation process by the maxillary division also okay and here's that picture we demonstrated before so let's to combine it with this one this is the geniculate so superficial petrosal how it's coming here and being inside the trigger canal and come here to forming that the trigger palatine ganglion that's the tympanic segment um, the tympanic segment, it's running also uh, eight millimeters after the genicular ganglion running down. And also it's really important because it's giving the, the nerve to stapedius muscle. So if there is a problem to the tympanic segment, it can also lead to the hyperacusis as we know here. Also, this one is situated here um, between the ANCAS and uh, the lateral semicircle canal. Also, we can see this radiological zoomed picture to demonstrating that's the tympanic or the horizontal segment. For the mastoid segment, we can see here that is the tympanic segment. And how you can know that's the tympanic segment because it's the lateral semicircular canal and the incus. So it's the tympanic segment. And then becoming the mastoid segment. And from that mastoid segment, that's running from, I think, A to uh, 14 millimeters uh, before uh, giving rise from the 
style of master ceramics and it's giving really really important branch here is the corda tympani the corda tympani as you pronounce it i don't know how you pronounce it uh this corda tympani are tympani uh, responsible for the test sensation of the tear two thirds of the tongue and also responsible for the salivatory function uh, of the submandibular gland and sublingual also okay here we are showing a zoom picture for the mastoid part or the vertical part or the vertical segment of the facial nerve and then it's emerging from the stylomastoid being extra temporal segment and being in the periphery and go to its final destination of the face to supply each muscle that's present on the face uh, responsible for the facial expressions also supplying the possibility of the digastric um so on the platysma and so on yeah. before finishing the neuroanatomy and surgical anatomy part i'm going to show you that really really amazing uh, picture uh that book is really great book uh i find it accidentally and spending two days just to looking for this amazing uh, job uh, i will uh, show you its picture uh, later uh, here, that's for the blood supply of the posterior circulation. You can see that's two vertebral artery inside the intervertebral foramen and emerging from the magnum to being here, both two vertebral artery in the medulla and unite to form the basilar artery. This is the posterior circulation. From the beginning of the basilar artery, you have this artery making a loop on the seventh and eighth nerve complex. This artery is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, the ICA. And this loop, it's really important to know because we will consider this on the part of the hemifacial spasm. So you have to know how the ICA uh, related to the facial and the vestibular complex. And you can know how that's the ICA giving the labyrinthinal artery and go to the labyrinth and you can see it on the labyrinthial segment of the facial nerve. Neuroanatomy always makes sense. That's my, my thing. Um, here, this picture for the angio, it's same. That's the ICA and how it's related to the internal auditory canal and giving the labyrinthinal part. Here, uh, it is an uh, axial section with a focus at, on this axial section. That is the bones, posteriorly is the cerebellum. Here is the basilar artery, and that makes sense. Basilar artery on the anterior part of the bones on the basilar groove, so it's it's positioned that. And here we can see that loop artery, that artery making that curvy. Here it is the, the ICA. And here that's the radiological picture representing how the ICA coming here on that vestibular and the facial complex. Also this picture we was uh, previously demonstrated and uh, we don't talk about this vessel. It is the ICA, how it's coming here on uh, the seventh and seventh and eighth complex. Uh, this is the book and this is the reference. It's really amazing. It could be helpful for all of you if you're doing any lecture or if you're studying anything uh, according to the cranial nerve. I'm, I'm super highly recommended it. M many, many of this picture taken from it. And now we'll finishing the uh, neuroanatomy uh, things. So let's to examine ourselves. So I just ask you to stop the video and solving the answers and then to see what I'm going to say. Which one of this diagram of showing the facial nerve inside the internal auditory canal? You can look here. I'm going with B because it's superiorly and anteriorly. So the B, it will be the answer for this one. It's the facial nerve. That's coming uh, from this uh, uh, neurosurgery self-assessment book. You can, uh, it could be useful for all of you. And here we are. All of the following can use in the differential diagnosis uh, between the glossopharyngeal and the facial nerve, except one. You have to stop the video and uh, answer it. Um, I'm going with the loose of the sensation to the artery. All of these are, are specified for something. Like the test sensation, anterior two third is for the facial, posterior is the glossopharyngeal. Salivatory, uh, the parotidic gland with the glossopharyngeal, the submandibular gland with the facial. Pharynx for the glossopharyngeal, uh, facial muscle with the facial. But these, these both, uh, loose of the sensation to the outer ear, 
both of them, both of the of the facial and the glossopharyngeal have the same things from the uh, spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Both of them has the pain and temperature sensation. So we cannot uh, uh, demonstrating our, our differential diagnosis from this part. So I'm dealing with that, okay? Hyperacusis will be present in the lesion of which part of the facial nerve? You have to answer it. Uh, I'm going with the horizontal or tympanic segment because it's giving the rise to the uh, nerve to the stapedius muscle also. Uh, choose the muscle that's supplying the facial, that's supplied by the facial nerve, each muscles. Um, all of them are supplied by the facial nerve, but you have to be wary with this type of MCQs because you're seeing the posterior bill of the digastric. Uh, of the digastric. Uh, maybe, maybe you can, you can find the anterior bill of the digastric and it's wrong answer because uh, it is supplied by, by the trigeminal nerve. During operation to the fourth ventricle tumor, facial calculi get damaged, so result paralysis and all except. Uh, this this question is really really important. You can see the boxinator and the orbicularis uh, oculi. It's also supplied by the facial nerve. Lateral rectus and lateral turiga is not supplied. So you have to choose from them. I'm going with the lateral turiga. It's supplied by the trigeminal nerve from the mandibular branch. So why I'm not choosing the lateral rectus? It's supplied by the abducens. And the abducens, it could be injured when there is an injury for the facial calculi because of that uh, loop that we say, right? Uh, all of these questions coming from this book, Neurosurgery Review. Now is the last question. You have to stop the video. It's quite, quite challenging for all of you. So uh, start to solve it. I, I know you can for sure. Here, uh, we are seeing that the internal auditory canal, so that is the meatal segment, and this is the, the superior uh, vestibular nerve. And if you can find an artery here, it will be the labyrinthinal artery. And here, you can see uh, the, lab the labyrinthinal segment, that's here, E. That is the geniculate ganglion, and that is the greater or the superficial uh, vitrosal nerve. That's taken from this book, Neurosurgery Board Review. It's really useful. Now we're finished with the anatomical part. Just before going through the facial nervous one, I just try to making some demonstration for some basic things that we have to we have to uh, memorize it. Uh, if there is a problem with the facial nerve, it could be lower motor neural lesion that means below the nucleus level, that will lead to the ipsilateral weakness or paralysis maybe to the side. Complete complete ipsilateral uh, weakness. But when there is the problem on uh, level uh, up uh, or above the nucleus, like on the motor cortex, that will lead to a contralateral weakness, you know, because of the decusations. And uh, it's only located for the lower part because the upper part of the face, that's the empirical color, it supplied from the contralateral side, as we see here, and also it's supplied from this side, from the ipsilateral side of the hemisphere. So that's just to demonstrating how to differentiate between the upper and lower facial motor neural uh, lesions, okay? Uh, here, uh, I'm, I'm just going to take some, some points about the examination of the facial nerve. There is a lot of, of, of things to examine in the, in the facial nerve, maybe uh, examine the, <clears throat> the hearing and the vestibular things, maybe you examine the test sensation, examine the, uh, stabia, stabidius muscle reflex and so on, but we will focus only on the facial uh, muscle expressions and uh, and the facial muscles uh, that we are um, demonstrated by by asking the patient to smile, to blink, to open the eyes, to close it tightly, and how it uh, can be against the power and so on. We depended on that, on the house Breckman grading skills. This grading skills, it uh, started from the one to six. The one is normal, the six is total paralysis, and then slightly moderate, severe, severe dysfunction. Uh, and that's with the scores. This is score according from how it's react to our, our question, how it's he blink, 
how he smile, how he raising the eyebrow, how is that uh, the forehead of the patient, and so on. I will show you some of the pictures that are taken from a YouTube video. You can also watch it. Uh, this is the grade one, which is normal. How the patient smile, how she can uh, close her eyes tightly, um, how she uh, open the eye, and so on. It's totally normal. This is a grade two. You can see the smile. It's it's slightly normal, but there is something different from this. You can see there is something different. You can see for the mouth angle here. You can see for both eyes. That's the grade two. Grade three. That's that's how she she smile, how the eye look, how the mouth corner look. Also in grade uh, four, that's grade four. You can demonstrate. Uh, it's uh, obvious here by closing the eyes, this one and this one, how this eye close and so on. This is grade five. Also, how the patient smile, and this is grade six. Uh, six. Total paralysis. It's it's total paralysis for for the side contra uh, ipsilateral total paralysis. Now uh, we are going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about the facial nerve schwannoma. The facial nerve schwannoma it's uh, not a common condition, but it's really important, and it's a slowly growing tumor on the facial nerve. It's the most common intrinsic facial nerve tumor that's originated from the facial nerve itself. It could affect male and female equally with a slightly predominance to the male. 93% uh, of the cases is sporadic, but there are some cases uh, come with a neurofibromatosis type 2, that's a, a familial disorder coming in such syndromes. And uh, facial nerve schwannoma, it can arise anywhere in the facial nerve cords that's surrounded by the Schwann cell. And we will demonstrating that. Uh, on the upcoming slide. Um, but you have to know that the most common uh, schwannoma, and because the schwannoma it can affect any nerve that's surrounded by the Schwann cell, is the vestibular nerve schwannoma, and then it's come the trigeminal nerve schwannoma, and then the lower complex, that's the close pharyngeal vagus accessory, and then we have the facial uh, nerve schwannoma. It's not that too common. So here we can see the side of the facial uh, nerve schwannoma. That's the cisternal, that's the meatus segment, here the labyrinthial, the geniculate, the tympanic, and the mastoid. So you can see here in the internal acoustic meatus, the meatal part. Also, it can be on the CP angle, the cisternal part. It can be on the geniculate segment. It's the most common site, the labyrinthial, the geniculate. It can be here, it can be here on the tympanic part, just before the the corda tympani of the mastoid segment because uh, if it's involved the corda tympani you have to think about uh, many of its consequences and here it could be present on the after the sterno uh, stylomastoid foramen because you know the stylomastoid foramen um it's it's uh going to the parotidic gland it's it's considered as any parotidic gland masses so it can be inside the cistern can be intratemporal and it can be extratemporal on the periphery. The most common site for the facial nerve schwannoma is the labyrinthinal, the labyrinthinal or the geniculate segment, followed by the tympanic and the mastoid. Slightly the tympanic more common than the mastoid segment. And then uh, it can affect the CP angle also, and it's really challenging because you have a big differential diagnosis of the CP angle masses or tumor, and less commonly, it can affect the corda tympani and uh, uh, nerve to stapedius. The presentation, <coughs> sorry. The presentation of patient with uh, facial nerve schwannoma, as we say, it is a slowly growing tumor, so we have 20% of the patient come to us asymptomatic and discover accidentally, okay? But the most common presentation, like 60 to 65%, is facial nerve weakness. And then followed by 50% of hearing loss. And then there is a variety of, of symptoms or signs that according to the site, 
maybe there is a vestibular symptoms like um, dizziness or, or vertigo or something like this. There is tinnitus, there is otalgia, dry eye also can affect. Parotid mass, if it, if it was on the extratemporal side, it can be demonstrated as a parotid mass. Uh, middle ear mass, we, we will uh, show some picture about these things. And you have also, don't ever, never confuse with the Bell's palsy. I read some articles and uh, it's these articles say that 4 to 7% of patients with facial nerve schwannoma are misdiagnosed with the Bell's palsy. It's come like mimicking for the Bell's palsy and you're just giving a steroid for them and uh, making some tumor to grow inside uh, our head. Um, it's, it's something you have to worry about for sure. For, radio, for the radiographic features, um, the imaging, it's mimicking like any schwannomas. It's homogeneous enhancement on both CT and MRI. And when it's being larger, it maybe will lead to heterogeneous enhance, enhancement. On the T1 of the MRI, uh, it's look like iso to hyper intense. And uh, on T2, it will like hyper intense. And uh, when the tumor became larger, it will be heterogeneous signal. For sure that, okay? Now we will demonstrating some of the cases. That's from the American Journal of the Neurosurgery. Uh, you can see that here and that here. Uh, this one demonstrating the geniculate or the labyrinthinal segment, which is the most common site of the facial uh, nerve schwannoma. And also you can see it here is extended to the internal auditory canal and also pressing on the CP angle. And this, we can say one of the typical shape, shapes that can help us to diagnose the facial nerve schwannoma. It's like the ice cream uh, cup. Well, that's the ice cream cup here. That's like this, uh, how it's emerging from the internal auditory canal to the CP angle. It can help us to differentiate it, but it's not, not pathognomonic for, for this. It's not pathognomonic sign. Okay, here we are showing a rare case of facial nerve was misdiagnosed as a TM joint problem. You can see in here. Uh, was treated, I, I, I read this this uh, case report, was uh, referred to maxillary facial uh, surgeon and uh, after uh, he uh, requesting for the MRI, you can see that this uh, hyperintense lesion here. Also, we can find uh, this, uh, this coronal sections for mastoid, uh, mastoid segment tumor, facial nerve schwannoma this hyper intensity here and here. Also this one, um, this one uh, it's uh, presented in the internal auditory canal and also extended to the CP angle here, that mass, you can see it here, it's the facial nerve schwannoma. And uh, this case for a giant facial nerve schwannoma that's extended from the middle cranial fossa to the mastoid region, this case report, or an interesting case report, you can see it here, obviously, and it's really, really obvious here with that uh, coronal section. And uh, this is a really big tumor, so you can find the heterogeneity that we're talking about, right? Also, this one, it's uh, mass demonstrated here, lesion here, facial nerve schwannoma. It's in the mastoid segment and with the further zoom for the mastoid area, as we do on the uh, anatomy part, we can see in this, this the mastoid the segment uh, facial nerve schwannoma. Also this. This is quietly challenging. It's the CP angle schwannoma, and it's it has a big differential diagnosis for any CP angle masses, as we can say. This one uh, was demonstrated by the ENT specialist who was looking for something inside the ear and find this uh, 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 retrotympanic mass, and he requesting for the MRI, and we finding this. Also, this one, it's uh, this mass presented here in the internal auditory canal. It's not uh, extended to the CP angle. You know, it's a slowly growing tumor, maybe in the future. I hope uh, full we resect this tumor 
before doing that uh, compressions and so on. Now we will talk about the differential diagnosis. Uh, the differential diagnosis depends on, on many things, it depending on uh, which part of which part is the effect, is it the site, the size, and, um, and so on. It's, uh, if it was extra temporal masses, you can think about the parotid, any parotid mass. If it was the CP angle, any CP angle mass, and so on. Let's do like, uh, um, take a look here for this. It's CP angle mass, it's a schwannoma, the most common schwannoma, it's a vestibular nervous schwannoma. It's also um, like the facial nervous schwannoma in the shape and you have to put it in, the, your, in your differential diagnosis. Also this one, the second most common schwannoma, facial nervous schwannoma, like you're seeing here and how it's uh, uh, reaching the middle uh, cranial fossa. And this one, I just want you to think about what is this? It is a really, really rare case. Uh, it is the absent nervous schwannoma. Uh, when I'm reading some article to looking for the absent nervous schwannoma, it's uh, really hard to read this article. And I read some article, it say that there is only 32 cases demonstrated in the, in the literature reviews or something like this. So it's really a rare case, but you also have to consider in your differential diagnosis, but not like the vestibular, it's, it's really common, as we say. Uh, this one, CP angle tumor, mm, it is the meningioma. Uh, just to be clear with all of you, I, I have some work uh, to do about the meningioma site just two days before. I have to find a question about the site of the meningiomas. And when I'm looking for the CP angle meningioma, my question was the differential diagnosis of the CP angle, uh, CP angle meningioma also should be considered for the facial and the vestibular also schwannoma. So it's, it's also considered in our uh, differential diagnosis. This one, this one we can see in here, epidermoid should be considered in the differential diagnosis. This one, pseudo aneurysm, pseudo giant aneurysm, we can see in here, any giant aneurysm should be considered. And uh, this one is really important. It's the hemangioma, that's a rare benign vascular tumor. It's also present with the small size because that small size can cause progressive facial weakness. So you also have to consider with your differential diagnosis. And also you have to consider some of many things uh, like chondromas and like uh, aberrant, aberrant uh, internal carotid artery. Maybe there is simple effusion. Maybe there is fatty marrow also uh, can, can demonstrate it and uh, misdiagnosis to the facial nerve schwannoma and we resect it for nothing. It's just a fatty marrow, okay? Now we're finishing the differential diagnosis. Let's to go for the treatment. Like to, uh, let's to uh, see what uh, Shirazi said. The treatment will be according to the hearing function, to the tumor growth rate, and to the surgeon experience, and also to the function of the facial nerve. Look, it's really, it's really quite important things, uh, that's the treatment of the facial nerve schwannoma. Uh, it's slowly growing the tumor. And whenever you're doing a resection or micro or decompression for the tumor, uh, you will not have ever a grade better than a grade three from the Brickman grading scales. So if if the tumor was a small site, not compressing the CP angle uh, with a good facial nerve function, like a grade one or two or maybe three. So we can put him under the observation and doing annual MRI or annual imaging for this patient to observe him. But if the tumor is big and have some uh, issues, some hearing issues and so on, no, we, we have to consider another things. Uh, the radiation, it's not a definitive treatment. So that's the radio surgery or the gamma knife. It's something to control the, the growing of the tumor, okay? And lastly, we have the surgery. It's really definitive treatments for resection of the tumor. And also, uh, uh, also we can decompress the tumor. You should consider it with, with, uh, with big size tumor, with the facial nerve dysfunction. And also, you don't have to observe for a lot of time. Maybe that will lead to hearing loss. So you, you have to know when it's, when's the right time to operate these patients. 
okay? Okay, now, the approaches. I'm not going on details for the approaches. Hopefully, I am doing a separated lecture for the vestibular and the facial nerve schwannoma approaches. I'm really quite, I'm really, really interesting on this subject. So, hopefully, in the upcoming future, we will do that. But for the approaches in general way, it's depending on the site, on the size of the tumor, and on the function of hearing function, the facial nerve function, and so on. Also for the surgeon preference. As we said before, if it was extra temporal masses, um, maybe it's not this neurosurgeon duty, and it's considered as any parotid masses. Uh, if, if it is... Um, with good size and uh, presented uh, on the mastoid or the tympanic segment, we can doing that uh, cell wall or CWL mastoidectomy. Also, if it was on the most common side, the labyrinthine or uh, the geniculate, you have to think if it was good hearing function, maybe we'll go with the middle fossa approach. Uh, if it was bad hearing functions and so on, you can do it with a translabyrinthinal approach with the mastoidectomy and the brinthectomy. If it was on the CB angle, we will do with the retromastoid approach and so on. I'm just showing some picture of that approach, not going on details of them, hopefully in the future. Uh, this one demonstrating the tympanic, the trans tympanic, uh, sorry, translabyrinthial approach. Uh, the translabyrinthial approach here uh, with that uh, view. And I'm just putting this picture just to make us oriented about the surgeon view because we always studying the anatomy on, on that position. Everything's on this and we coming to the operation room and everything's upside down. I'm, I'm not studying that things. Yeah, so we have always to, to think with the uh, surgeon view and the upside down anatomy. Here we demonstrating that the middle fossa approach, and this one the surgeon view, and this is the retro uh, sigmoid approach, uh, retro mastoid sorry, uh, approach. Uh, this approach uh, we will uh, talk about it and and in in, in a clarified way in the part of the hemifacial spasm also. Okay. Um, this part of the facial nerve one I'm taking from many articles, and this book it's really helpful for all of you if you want to review uh, the the surgery of the facial nerve. It's it's really helpful, I think. Also, I'm showing you this picture from a YouTube video about resection of the geniculate segment uh, or, uh, or geniculate ganglion tumor of the facial nerve schwannoma. Here, as you can see. And you can see the full video on the Maya Clinic. Um, it's 38 minutes, um, really, really well explained video. And I'm really grateful for them. Now uh, we finished the facial nerve issue. I'm going to take some uh, challenging question. You have to uh, stop uh, the sharing, uh, stop the video, and uh, uh, trying to solve it with yourself. Uh, now I'm trying to solve it without looking for this because. Uh, when I'm looking for this question uh, on the neurosurgery board review, I, I told myself, I, I, I previously watched this picture, but it was modern with, with color. Ah, I remember, it is that second picture on the CP angle chapter of the Rotom book. So let's do, let's do take it as the Rotom way. This is the flocculus, this is the flocculus of the, of the cerebellum. So here we have the pons and this is the, vestibular and the, and, the, and the facial complex. So this is below is the lower nerve complex. This is the glossopharyngeal, vagus, and the accessory here. Also, when you're finding an artery making the, that loop or curve here, it's the eye cap for sure. And now let's to look for these complexes. Uh, this one is the, super, this is the vestibular, and this one is the cochlear. And you're looking here is the facial. And this facial separated into the intermediate and the intermediates on the, the facial, motor facial. That's the motor facial and that is the intermediate. And uh, the arcuate, subarcuate fibers, or subarcuate arteries, sorry. It's not clear, really clear here, but uh, I'm sure it will be somewhere here. Really sure. Not because B said it's the subarcuate artery. No, no, but um, uh, it's, it's, that's the location of the subarcuate artery also. Right? And if you're asking yourself, what is that? 
um, it's artery coming here in the lower complex. So it's pica, posterior inferior cerebellar artery also, okay? Now, uh, which of the following is not seen with the lesion of the facial nerve immediately distal to the geniculate ganglia, something distal to geniculate ganglia? Um, I'm going with the impairment of lacrimation. Lacrimation is coming from the geniculate ganglia as a superficial petrosal. So if it's distal, so it, there is no impairment for it. Uh, extracranial facial nerve anastomosis can be done by. Uh, look, I'm doing some teaching a process by asking a question. I'm not talking. I'm not talking previously about this, but in every and every surgery of the facial nerve or a tumor resection or something like this, uh, you can consider the facial nerve anastomosis. The facial nerve anastomosis can be uh, side to side with the hypoglossal nerve commonly, and also it can be with all of these things. And also you can do, uh, you can do facial nerve grafting from somewhere else, right? Uh, this is a quiet question. I'm really like this type of question. It's like uh, someone want to catch you. Uh, Schwannoma arises from all of the front cranial nerves. Yeah, I know uh, it's arising from every, every nerve that's surrounded by the Schwann cell. Uh, especially vestibular, trigeminal, uh, facial, but it's not present in the optic and the olfactory because they are surrounded by the oligodendrocyte. So if there is a problem, it will, it will uh, combine with oligodendrocytoma, not schwannoma, okay? Uh, right. Now, uh, this type of question also for, for teaching, not for, for uh, testing. Uh, there is some investigation or a new reactive investigation you can request if you are not sure that it is a schwannoma because it's, for example, on the CP angle and uh, there is a wide of differential diagnosis. So S100 can give you a uh, suspicion for that is schwannoma, not oligodendroglioma, not, not low-grade stroocytoma, and so on. Okay, it's associated with uh, schwannoma. And this question coming from this uh, neurosurgery practice question and answering. Uh, now we are going to the hemifacial spasm. For the hemifacial spasm, it's the last part of our lecture. Uh, it is condition that present in the facial nerve over firing or over activity of the facial nerve make your muscle twitching or twitching here in especially in the lower part of the eyelids, around the eye and around the corner of the mouth, make you grumpies, like uh, you have some bad emotion like this, and someone uh, with bad emotion. This intermittent uh, attack coming for this patient, and this is the first picture was documented in the history for the hemifacial spasm patient, and this patient, uh, indicating and signing for it is it triggers and it's being overreacted uh, when there is uh, compressing on the face when also there is uh, like an anxiety there is exercise or, or with with the mood uh, things and also this uh, it's usually come uh, unilateral but it's come bilaterally and uh, it's, it's incidence more on the higher age and we will demonstrating why. And uh, it's affecting slightly the female more, more than the males, okay? Uh, now let's to look for the causes of the hemifacial spasm. Maybe it's idiopathic and there is many hypotheses uh, to share on uh, to say why is that uh, caused the hemifacial spasm. Maybe it's be psychotic with many psychosis uh, diseases. Uh, the patient making this twitching uh, on his face. And uh, really important to consider the microvascular compression uh, by especially the ICA. Maybe it be consequence of the Bell's palsy and also it can be by some mass effect like schwannomas, vestibular, facial, and so on, okay? For the diagnosis, you can, uh, taking the history, how it starts, from where, on the lower part of the eyelids, uh, how is the attack, and also doing the examination and requesting for the imaging of trace, which is the MRI, and you can see that loop to the artery can compressing here on the root exit zone. 
uh, for the treatment, uh, there is many consideration. Uh, Startly with the medication, like the trigeminal neuralgia, or neuralgia, uh, you can consider the anticonvulsant. It's not epilepsy, but uh, it's uh, acting on the near firing or overactivity, like the carbamazepine or the tigeritols. But you know, it has many of side effects and many of things, and it can be effective maybe only for the mild cases. Also, we can use a botulin a toxin injection, that the Botox. It's effective maybe, but uh, it can lead to uh, some cosmetic issue. As we know, the hemifacial spasm is something uh, uh, embarrassing, something uh, make uh, cosmetic issue. So you're not going to treat it with something also causing a, a cosmetic issues. Um, because it can cause a facial nerve, a facial muscle and nerve paralysis. Also, it uh, should be repeated every three to six months and so on. And maybe you can do a facial nerve needling uh, by trans tympanic uh, needle. Uh, maybe you can do a partial neurectomy. And the most importantly, that's the part we were talking about, is the microvascular decompression. It's the surgery of the facial nerve hemifacial spasm. Uh, it's really effective with uh, 8 to 9, 80, 80 to 90%. Uh, successful rate with the low rate of recurrence. Um, yeah, it has some complications, but it's really, really effective. So here, the microvascular decompression surgery, it's uh, doing a tefillon patch to decompress the artery from the nerve, from the root exosome, and also from the brainstem, can compress the brainstem also. Um, as we're seeing here, that's the anatomy of the retro mastoid approach here that's the vestibular facial complex and how the eye can compressing here and this is the sinuses for the positioning of uh, this patient with the uh, mvd uh, i we preferring the lateral position and we can saying the park bench positioning like uh, those on the airport waiting for their long transit uh, uh, journey and you can see that's how the head stand with the clip, uh, clipping, clamping here, and how the shoulder retracted by this uh, plasters just to increase the surgeon working zone also. Now for the incision, uh, all of this uh, slides taking from, from now, uh, from uh, Dr. Aaron Cohen, from the Neurosurgical Atlas Society. I'm taking the request from that really great prof and uh, it was really, really helpful for all of us and all of that young generation of the neurosurgery. Dr. Aaron Cohen uh, showing that the curvilinear incision, in his opinion, it's better for the pain of the muscle. Uh, many surgeons can use the linear, can use the hockey stick. It's according to the surgeon preference. And we can see that here that there is a monitor for the hearing process because you're dealing with something uh, really near to the vestibular uh, near vestibular cochlear nerve. Uh, here is the uh, root of the zygoma. Here is the enia. So that's uh, mimicking or demonstrating uh, the transverse sinus. Here is the tip of the mastoid. Here is the mastoid groove. So this imaginary line meeting from the mastoid groove with that line, making that that's the uh, transverse sigmoid junction. And with the with the surgery of decompression for the facial nerve, you don't have to uh, to to show and demonstrate this junction during the surgery as we did on the trigeminal neurology because we are doing to lower level complexes, not the five, it's the fifth, sorry. Uh, we're going to the seventh and the eighth. So we can do in here, that, that's the, the bar hole or the incision. That's after uh, opening the incision. Here is the mastoid and the bar hole will be somewhere here, just below the, uh, the transverse sigmoid junction. This picture after uh, drilling the bone, and this is the dura, and we'll opening the dura just parallel to the sigmoid sinuses. Um, here we are looking for the dura. It's uh, hanging by the stitches, 
and this is the cerebellum. We will retract it to go for the lower complex. And this is not my pointer, it's Dr. Aron pointer. <laughs> I can't uh, make it around. Uh, you can see that's pointer, Dr. Aron pointer, bigger than my pointer. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Aron. And here you can see, that's Dr. Aron pointer also. Uh, that's uh, when we going inside the, the that's the retro mastoid uh, approach and uh, demonstrating that the vestibular and facial nerve complexes and how this artery can affecting here. Now I will showing you some uh, operation videos here. You can see that here, this is the artery. Uh, I think it's ICA, this is the vestibular, here this is the facial, that's the, the ICA, how it's compressing on the facial, root exit zone, and also on the brainstem, on the pons. Now we will demonstrating how we are doing uh, tef teflon patches to uh, uh, decompress the artery, and you have to choose a good size for this teflon, teflon patch. Uh, to decompress the artery efficiently and not too big to that maybe will making in the future a complication as a granuloma of the teflon patch, as we know, and also will cause the decompression and uh, recurrent attack of the hemi hemifacial spasm. Also, we are doing ad additional teflon, teflon patch for the brainstem to be sure that the artery are not compressing uh the brain stem as you see here that's here okay now the decompression uh, surgery was done that's our own mouse <laughs> our own dr Aaron cohen pointer no it's mine uh now we're finishing this procedure now we're looking for this that's picture taken from my prof or my mentor really really great mentor dr samar from his uh journey uh, in japan um <clears throat> in japan they use this picture was for trigeminal neurology also decompression but i it's also can be applicable or applicable for the hemifacial spasm in japan they use uh, the transposition, not the interposition. We use in, you use to do a teflon patch to interpose between the artery and the nerve. But they also can using transposition, like a sling of the of the teflon, and this sling that's uh, retracting or that coming transposit the artery from the from the nerve and can sit on on anywhere on inside. Uh, the area on this area, maybe in the bone or anywhere, you can you can uh, choose. It could be effective. It could be used in hemifacial spasm, maybe with uh, better better uh, prognosis, less recurrent, uh, less graninoma of the of the of the teflon patch, and so on. Okay. Now we're finishing our lecture. Before finishing it, let's to take some of MCQ. Much of the following microvascular compression syndrome, it's quite really important to know that hemifacial spasm commonly presented with the offending artery is the ICA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Trigeminal neurology must commonly come with the superior cerebellar artery. But it's not always, maybe it could be combination. I, I saw some cases, it combined from the uh, petrosal artery, uh, uh, sorry, petrosal vein, and the IK and the superior cerebellar artery, all of them compressing the trigeminal nerve. So it could be happen. Glossopharyngeal nerve or the lower complex, glossopharyngeal neurology, it could be affected by the pica. Or so also the torticollis, it can be, uh, affected by the vertebral artery compression. For the hemifacial spasm, uh, is a focal movement disorder, which may be difficult to treat. The following statement, uh, which of the following statement is it true? We have to read it. We can use a botulinum toxin. We can treat with a microvascular decompression surgery. May it follow Bell's palsy. There are there may be bilateral involvement, yeah, there is. And the hemifacial spasm and the platial myclonus are uh, the only inv involuntary movement presented during sleep. Um, yes, it's true. All of these following are true, yeah. <laughs> 
Now, all of these questions taken from the neurosurgery review book, that's you can uh, get some question or some MCQ from it. Also, now I'm finishing my last lecture. Thank you all for that great listening. Uh, I am sorry for being quiet and longer than the expected time. If you have any question, you can ask me on uh, my YouTube channel. And uh, I am really, really grateful for that. And I'm really grateful to answer them all. Thank you very much. And see you in the upcoming lecture. Goodbye.